My name is Barbara. I'm a blank builder and a blogger, and I'm on a mission to rebuild and repurpose this 71-year-old aircraft construction aluminum trailer home, Alley Mo. But today I want to show you my tiny house. I started building my tiny house in January of 2005. I had a full-time job as a scientist, so every two weeks I'd take my paycheck and buy lumber, and then on the weekends I would build my house. A lot of the materials are surplus and salvage, or materials I had left over from other projects. My house is so small, it doesn't take a lot of material, so what's left over from a big job is enough to build an entire tiny house. I'm going to talk about some construction details as well as maintenance that I do on my house. I'm doing an intense spring cleaning where I move everything out so I can scrub underneath it. So I thought it would be a good time to do a tour of the tiny house. My house is clad with hardy plank, with hardy plank trim boards. But the top part is done with hardy shingles and my soffits were too wide for my hardy soffit, so I did them in this sort of step fashion. And I have a bent sheet metal rake flashing, and the vent stack for my bathroom comes out of the wall instead of the roof. When I put the siding on my house, I used a snapper shear to cut the hardy plank. I love this tool because it's quiet and feels relatively safe compared to a circular saw. But a saw blade leaves a sort of a burnished edge. The shear basically works by pulverizing the product. It leaves the cut in very dusty. I didn't realize at the time just how problematic that would be. But I should have. Caulk can't stick to dust. Where the factory ends butt up against the corner trim, the caulk joints look perfect. But the ends I cut, the caulk didn't stick. Little cracks appeared. I should have washed the ends of the siding in a bucket of water with a brush and then let them dry before caulking. Since I didn't do that, I had to redo the caulk 12 years into the 50-year warranty. I cut the caulk where it was very strongly bonded to the corner boards and I got all the old caulk out of the joints. I could make dust come billowing out of the crack with these little dental brushes I got at the grocery store. I washed the whole house down with a scrub brush and a hose after I opened up all the cracks. Then I scrubbed out each little crack again with a tiny dental brush until no more dust came out. At the end of the job, I had about 115 grams of wasted caulk. This is a data point without a purpose. I was able to recaulk all these joints with less than one tube of caulk. I bought one gallon of satin house paint and repainted the lap siding on three sides of the house. I still have over a quarter paint left. The roof of my tiny house is industrial sheet metal. My roofing metal was eight foot cutoffs from a bigger job and it was enough to do my whole house and that's why my roof has this interesting profile because uh, the pieces weren't very long. You can also see all the pine straw on my roof. One of my regular maintenance tasks is several times a year is I have to sweep the pine straw off the roof. It's time to do it again now. This little bump out is because I didn't trim my rafter tails. I just put siding over them because if I had made that transition sharp, I wouldn't have been able to nail anything into the acute angle at the top. So by making this little uh, I don't even know what to call it, this thing, this bump out place, I was able to, uh, to make my, my wall and roof work out. My ceiling is made with a hardy soffit, 16 inch wide smooth hardy material. My cousin gave me some paint samples that she bought to try on her house and I kind of liked them together so I had two quarts of this paint for free so I just made stripes. Uh, in between my hardy soffit is some PVC lattice nailed up. 
just to cover the joints. When I first built my house, I didn't have a porch. I had a patio. And the steps came down to these three uh, 4x4s. And then I decided I wanted to turn my door around. I had an in-swing door. And I decided to turn it around so it was an out-swing door and build a porch. So the patio is still underneath there. And I totally reused the steps. The, there was nothing wrong with the, the stair treads or the uh, risers. I have since replaced two of the treads. So these two treads are new. They split and wore out. Um, so I've been replacing these one at a time. I can get them at Home Depot for, they're about $11 a piece. So as they wear out, I get new ones. And uh, it seems to be working good as long as they don't discontinue these stair treads. So this stair tread is 15 years old. And this one's about two years old. And this one is one year old. My porch floor is screwed down, directly screwed down with deckmate screws. And then I putty over it with that Minwax putty that smells like Bondo. And then paint the whole thing. I didn't wait for it to cure anything. I primed it and painted it with bare porch paint and it's holding up really well. This is at least 10 years or 12 years old. A few years ago my house started to sink. And the way I knew was this conduit broke and my main drain to the septic tank broke. What happened was my posts that I had buried directly into the ground had started to rot. They started to rot right at the interface to the ground. So I bought some house jacks, some of which I have left here. So I bought these house jacks and jacked the house back up about an inch. And then I dug out around the posts and I formed up concrete footings with uh, Simpson strong tie brackets. Poured me some concrete. And then I added these two by six braces. Between the ribbon joist and the concrete footing. And that stiffened up those four by fours a lot. One thing I found really fascinating when my when I was digging out these posts that had rotted, the one that was the least rotted was the one right by the outdoor shower. Because I have a shower pan. Underneath this gravel there's uh, a layer of visqueen that's made into a shower pan and it drains into a dry well, a gravel uh, a ditch full of gravel under the ground so that the outdoor shower doesn't run out on the ground. And the result of that design is that this post did not rot out when all of the other ones did. Of course I redid the footing under it anyway. And then I completely rebuilt my shower. My outdoor shower floor requires maintenance cleaning mostly. And then from time to time I replace some of these things. See this one is cracked. I might need to replace that one soon. I've only replaced two of these in uh, 15 years though. And I reuse the screws every time. These stainless steel screws are going to last forever. The rest of my outdoor shower in my rebuild project, uh, the walls of my outdoor shower are made with vinyl blinds. You can get vinyl blinds cut at Home Depot. So I had a package of vinyl blinds cut to this length and I screwed them on with stainless steel pan head screws. And this has held up for several years. It looks good, it's lightweight. I've been really pleased with this outdoor shower screen. I mean, it's, it's kind of wonky, but I don't care, it's fine. I just took a shower and in the time it took me to get dressed and get out here with the camera, you can see that this wall is already dry. Um, this is porcelain tile with epoxy grout 
and uh, it looks exactly the same as the day I finished it 15 years ago and I imagine this will be the last thing remaining on my house. I'll maybe scrub it with a stiff bristled brush once a year or so if it gets a little algae on it but it's amazing. Uh, after 15 years this shower head the chrome is flaking off but it's brass underneath so I don't think anything bad's gonna happen. It's getting gross with um, calcium buildup. I need to soak it in vinegar. I took this part off and cleaned it with vinegar a year or two ago because um, it gets water spots on it but I just take it all apart and soak it in vinegar and it's fine. Let's take a moment to admire my north elevation. Pretty cute, huh? I got that round window at Surplus and Salvage Place. I think it makes my house look a little bit like a birdhouse. The lines from the mini split are uh, two copper lines, an in and an out, and a control wire, plus a condensate line. With some vinyl gutter and aluminum flashing, I was able to make this enclosure for the lines for the air conditioner. That looks much nicer. When I started building my house, this little tree right here was only in the wiregrass stage, which means it was just a little thing about this big, and I was real careful not to step on it or damage it, so this tree is 15 years old, minimum. So this is what longleaf does if it's kept in the shade and grows really slow, so 15 year old longleaf pine. I'll have to cut it down when it starts to interfere with the house, but I'm keeping it for now. It's like my pet. This aluminum table is basically my outdoor kitchen. The back feet are secured to the floor with a bolt through the last deck board so that it doesn't fall off. In a previous life, I was an interior designer, and these porcelain tiles were samples I got for the floor of a gymnasium in an Air Force base. I wonder if they ever built it. I like the color combo. I get my induction hot plate out of the house. And I have this little skewer I use to prop open my cover for my outlet because I uh, my old hot plate, it damaged the strain relief on the cord from the tension of the spring in this lid. Now if I want to cook something that makes a big mess, like fry something, I'll get a piece of corrugated plastic, those big sheets they sell at Home Depot, and lean that up against the wall. And sometimes I'll put a drop cloth down if I'm making jelly or something because I can just slide it under the front feet of the table and then if I splash cranberries or something on the floor it doesn't get all sticky. When I first built my house I bought this pre-hung fur door from the lumber yard. I stained it with a, a Chinese red lacquer color stain and finished it with a water-based polyurethane. So originally this was the inside of my door. But then I turned the whole thing around. I took the I took the jam out and took the threshold off and reversed it. So now it swings out. My dad made me this oak threshold that I just love. This oak threshold is the bomb. And that's the only thing in my house that has an oil-based finish. That has spar varnish. But all the rest, the rest of my clear finishes are water-based polyurethane. Um, I just wore a respirator when I did that. You may be looking at these 2x4s thinking, Barbara, what the hell are those? You know, I don't know. It seemed like a good idea at the time. Part of my ongoing maintenance is to watch caulk joints like this. I need to fix this. It never gets wet. Even in hurricanes, this doesn't really get wet up here. But it does get wet when I wash it. So I need to fill this caulk gap. Let's take a look at the inside. I'll spin the camera.
reason my tiny house doesn't feel tiny is because it has so much light from these giant windows and you can just see outside all the time. So you don't feel closed in, you just feel part of the outdoors, but without the bugs and with air conditioning. Now the camera is set for the indoor lighting. My grandparents enclosed a porch at their house with sliding glass doors, maybe in the 70s or 80s. And in about 2004, a microburst tornado knocked a tree down on it and they tore it down and built an exact replica, but with flowy glass. So they gave me all the sliding glass doors that came out of it, and I used four of them in my house. Um, I used all three foot ones. I still have some four foot ones in my shed in case I want to build a bigger tiny house. I moved into my house in November when I just had Tyvek over the window holes. So I was motivated to put the windows in. I tried to do all of them in a weekend and I didn't really know how. I didn't have a real good plan when I framed up the openings. So I just sort of shoved them the hell in there and just coughed the fuck out of it because I needed it to not be so cold. Um, so I don't really, I, I, one day I will take these out and, and buy some good low E glass window, um, plate glass windows to put in here um, and do it properly. But it's holding up I and mean, it's not leaking or anything. This thing is a plenum for the exhaust fan. Right here I have a switch for my fan and uh, the light over my head and the light over the sink. Um, so let's see what the fan sounds like. So that's not bad. It's just sort of a, a low rumble. You want to hear what it sounds like outside? And there's a, a, a opening here where it sucks air to the outside. And then there's another one in the house part in the loft. And this thing, this bump out is so the plumbing stack can go out the wall. For lighting in my bathroom, here in this little uh, vestibule, I have a ceramic schoolhouse light that I got on eBay and I um, fixed it, uh, I put a new socket in it, but I love me some ceramic fixtures from eBay. They, they don't go bad, they're great. Um, and I have a, um, a 60 watt bulb with uh, a reflective bottom in it right now uh, because I bought some on sale when I was buying lamp parts. Um, I haven't gone to all LEDs and stuff because that light's on like maybe five minutes a day. The lights here at the sink um, are just che the cheapest $15 light fixtures that Home Depot carries that I didn't hate. And um, they're... I, I insist that lights be on either side of the mirror. Um, overhead light is right out, but these are fine. And they're not on that much. I have so much light in here. I mean, do I need lights? No, I don't need lights. When all my clothes and stuff are in here, I have a mirror right here in front of the window where I can do makeup and stuff. And the lighting is just perfect. It's my favorite thing about this bathroom. Um, this window faces west, um, so if I'm going out during the day, I can use the mirror and do my face. The ceiling in the bathroom is tongue and groove pine, uh, which is not airtight because it's tongue and groove. Um, so acoustically, this is a problem when it rains. It is significantly louder in the bathroom than in the part of the house where I made the ceiling airtight. I did that on purpose for that very reason so it wouldn't be so loud but for the bathroom it was just easier um, and I did it later. My sink and bathtub are both old. Um, they both have the date 
printed on them. This is from the 30s and this is from the 50s. Uh, my cousin gave me this bathtub. Uh, she was using it as a, just a piece of furniture in her bedroom. She got it at an antique shop and just had filled it up with pillows and would read in it. Um, but I wanted it for a bathtub. So it was in really good shape, uh, but it was painted on the outside. Um, so I stripped the paint off with a wire brush, or actually I think it was a nylon brush on a drill. So I cleaned all the paint off the outside, and then I, um, I treated it with Penetrol, which is a, a linseed oil uh, paint additive, but it works great as a metal finish. So um, this just has a Penetrol coating on it, and it's held up really great. Um, and it, it has a lovely patina. Let's see if I can get a close up. I got this floor tile at the surplus and salvage place. They had a couple of boxes, which was enough for my space. This is a porcelain quarry tile made in Tennessee. And it's very thick and very heavy. Um, but it has a lot of thermal mass. So I put um, heating elements under the floor um, so that it uses that thermal mass, heats it up, and then that's my heat for my house. where your doors go in a tiny house because that amount of floor space is valuable so it's nice to have sort of a little parking place this bathroom door is just a two-foot door um, and uh, it's just big enough to get a clawfoot tub in a clawfoot tub is 24 inches from top to bottom without the feet on it so you turn it sideways and carry it through the door and then you put the feet on it and it looks like a more substantial piece of furniture so this is my panel box. Um, I have a 50 amp breaker for my water heater. Um, 20 amps of just outlets. And this is a, uh, the air conditioner, 30 amps for the air conditioner. This is my uh, mini split, the one and a half ton mini split for this house. Um, I have a 20 amp breaker for the floor. It's no different than a hair dryer, really. Um, and these 20 amp breakers are just outlets. This 15 amp breaker is just undersized. I have wiring for 20 amps. I just had a 15 amp breaker. This has always puzzled me. I have a 100 amp breaker here, but that breaker at the, that feeds this is a 90 amp breaker. Uh, what? I have to tell you about this window. So this is another one of the sliding glass doors from my grandparents house. And when I was framing this wall, I had my book and I read about what to do and how to, how to size the rough opening. Originally, I was planning to take the aluminum off the, the double pane glass section and just mount the glass directly in the wall. But I didn't really have the equipment to mill out the right, st um, the right parts. Well, it didn't work out. I ended up using the aluminum and I just sort of built up the opening until it worked using hardy plank. So there's a piece of hardy plank directly on my floor that goes all the way through the wall. And it's then it rains right on that piece of hardy plank. So if my caulk fails, water is gonna run either above the hardy plank or under or under the hardy plank on my floor. So this is bad and I feel much shame. I want to take this apart. Um, this wall has, uh, you know, a minuscule amount of siding. It would be a day's work to take 
this whole wall apart and rebuild these two windows and put it all back together. Um, but I would have to buy the windows and this amount of low E glass would be expensive. But if I ever come into money, um, I'm going to do this. Now let's talk about my floor. This is a maple floor. It looks like this in cross section. While I was living in Atlanta, my cousin salvaged this maple from a basketball court at a nearby high school that had a plumbing disaster and flooded the basketball court and the floor buckled. And uh, it was almost time for school to start before they realized. So they went in with forklifts and just scraped this stuff off the floor and dumped it outside. And my cousin came along with his trailer and just loaded it up and made multiple trips. And then he stacked it properly in my shed to dry. Um, and there was a huge stack of it. It was taking up my whole shed. And he built a, a boat building workshop out of it. And I built my house floor out of it. And then I traded the rest of it to my dad for a lawnmower. With wood this thick, there's no reason to have joists every 16 inches or even 24 inches. So I did a plank and beam frame where there are two beams uh, at four foot centers. So I have a beam at four feet, another beam at four feet, and the two ribbon joists around the edge. So instead of doing staggered joints on a subfloor, this, this is it, this is all there is. So I ran the boards um, so that the, the joints fall on the beam. So instead of being staggered, there's this regular pattern. Every now and then there's no, there's no gap because I had some boards, I had like five or six that were um, 12 feet long. So those go the full width of the house. I thought that would make it stiffer if I spaced them out. So I spaced them out across the 12 foot square. And there are these little holes from, I don't know, some basketball purpose that I don't understand. I don't care. I have some round dents in the floor that are from dropping the track ball out of my loft. This big old dent is from where I knocked over my tripod. There's a lot of noise in a tiny house. My refrigerator is running almost all the time and when I turn my air conditioner on it gets even louder. But it's kind of a pleasant white noise and it's not that bad. But you would have to think about it. I mean, there's no way I could have a, uh, an aquarium in here or anything else that makes noise constantly. Besides, an aquarium would be a, a disaster just from a moisture perspective. Um, but you have to have the air conditioning in South Georgia. Now, the, the air conditioner here in the house is a lot louder than the one in my lab. Um, so one day I'll upgrade it and then it'll be quieter but it still works, so I'm not getting rid of it as long as it's still working. This is where I get makeup air for my exhaust fan. I just cut one section of this board out, and then I, I have some filter material in here. I got this sink on clearance at Home Depot Expo in Fort Lauderdale when I was working on a hurricane, um, and it was about 80% off. It was a couple hundred bucks, but it's usually thousands. So I was very excited to get this cast iron sink. I had this green porcelain tile left over from my house in Atlanta, and I also had a section of uh, weedy shower curb left. Um, so I cut it in half and made this um, shelf. So anyway, so this is this is a weedy uh, shower curb made into a backsplash because this Corian countertop is a surplus countertop I got at um, the surplus and salvage place that was a bathroom counter which are not as wide as kitchen counters so the counter stops shy of the wall um, so that my cabinet would work. I already had this Sub-Zero refrigerator when I started building this house it's an all refrigerator, so this drawer is the crisper drawer, and this drawer is the uh, jelly drawer, in my case. It's where I keep all my jelly. 
and this is the regular refrigerator. I covered the um, door with just more of the paneling. I cut the tongue and groove off and glued up a panel of the uh, same wood I was using on the walls. This tile and this tile I had left over from Atlanta and I bought the yellow tile and the border to finish out the design because um, it was just a couple squares. I just bought it off the shelf at Home Depot. I already had this cabinet when I started building the house. I got it on clearance the same place I got the refrigerator. So I liked the cabinet. I wanted to use that and that's where I have basically my most important kitchen stuff. I keep my dishes in a drawer and um, keep my toaster and my rice cooker in a drawer. And I didn't see any reason I needed a cabinet under the sink. It just makes it hard to work on. So I don't have a cabinet under the sink because I need to work on it. Let me show you. So under the sink, I reinforced the side of the, the stock cabinet with some of my tongue and groove boards just because these are just thin plywood walls. So I reinforced the side because it's got to hold up this massive cast iron sink. So what I did is I made a a shelf with another piece of the tongue and groove um, to hold up the sink. On the other side I think I used a 2x4. But then I had to get the sink up there and I can't lift the sink by myself so I had to sort of lift it up a little bit at a time and put books under one side and then lift the other side and put books under that until I got it high enough to lift it and slide it into the, the space. So it's not that the, the way the edge came out is uh, not ideal but damn I was I almost killed myself so I'm lucky it's in there at all. Now under here I've had a really hard time with the drain on this sink. It, it always wants to leak and you can see by the corrosion what a mess it is. So the um, the gasket thing around the um, the drain basket those things whatever rubber they make plumbing parts out of I hate it. I hate the way it smells so much. I've painted this with um, water-based polyurethane to tr just to make it so I can't smell it. It kept dripping really just very slow drip and built up all this corrosion but finally the corrosion has stopped the dripping so I'm not going to touch it. If I take it apart, I'm going to have to replace all of it to get it to, to stop. When I first built this house, I had a different water heater. I had the cheapest water heater I could get, which was made by EE Max, and it was garbage. It was about $150. Total piece of shit. So I saved up my money and bought this one that cost twice as much but twice as much in instant water heaters is only like still less than three hundred dollars i did the vent stack wrong i didn't vent the sink properly so it doesn't drain as fast as it ought to i didn't know what i was doing i still don't if i had figured it out i would redo it but i still don't know how to do it i um i wrote a little note and put it there in case something happens to me and my brother inherits this house and he starts cussing me because he doesn't know what the hell's going on. You can uh, see that I was sorry. Because I had to move in before I finished, the way I did the water is I just hooked it up so that it would get me through what I needed to do. And then as I was ready to add more things, I would just cut the pipe and add a, uh, a T and put it in another thing. The first water I had was go into that um, shower valve on the outside wall and then the next thing I had was the bathroom sink and then I added the outside shower and then I added the kitchen sink last. In this corner you can see the basis of my construction technique. So this is the pressure treated 4x4 that goes all the way into the ground and all the way up to the roof. So the, the house is tied together really well and it allowed me to build it by myself. I, there wasn't anything to tip over or fall on me and I could just add pieces one member at a time 
So I, I just got the four posts stuck up there and then I just started adding pieces until it got um, housey. So here where the, the wall boards don't go all the way to the post, you can see the um, spray foam. This is isonine open cell spray foam. When I built this house, manifolds were really expensive. But when I did my lab, the price on manifolds had come down a lot and I enjoyed using that. That was a much tidier solution. I've got this emptied out for spring cleaning, but typically there's a bunch of shit shoved under here. That's the typical collection of stuff under there. And then you can't really see it when you're standing up. This aluminum rail is from Ikea, and it holds uh, these accessories, this dish drainer. And this one's for cutlery. And it's nice, because you can take them down to clean them, or take them down just so it's more decorative when you have a lot of company over for a wedding. Uh, this also folds up, so I guess you could just fold it up for whatever reason. But I hardly ever fold it up. If I was going to fold it up, I'd just take it all the way down. One thing that I had to do to modify this, I used this for years and it just sort of dripped all over and it started making um, uh, calcium buildup on my faucet. So I got a plastic cutting board, which just miraculously was exactly the right size. I punched some holes in the corner with a hole punch. Then I got some aluminum armature wire. And just hook it on there. And now all the water just runs out the front and doesn't get all over my faucets and stuff. I swapped out my rug while I'm washing the other one. And the the longer rug covers up this extra piece of floor and look how look how much lighter the maple is where the sun hit it compared to where it was covered up by the rug. So maple lightens in the sun. But check this out. Pine darkens in the sun. So where it's been covered up by that cutting board, it's lighter. My whole house is getting darker and darker with years. See this outlet up here? Originally I had a light fixture screwed right here with a cord, but um, I decided I didn't like it and, and took it down. This hole is where I had my computer mounted on a pole here for a while. or peaches to make jam. But usually it lives here. I have this glass cutting board that I keep here with my hot plate on it. So this is where my hot plate lives. My other cooking utensils are a toaster and a rice cooker. So these typically live up here, unless I need the space for something else. This Fuzzy Logic rice cooker, toaster, microwave oven, and induction hot plate are the only cooking appliances that I keep in the house. I 
I love my Panasonic Fuzzy Logic rice cooker. It's so cute. Look at it. Look at it. This is the cabinetry of desperation. But you know what? It's worked for 15 years. And it hasn't even bothered me that I didn't put any shoe mold or anything on it. It's just open. So I just screwed two by fours to the floor and then nailed tongue and groove planks on it. It's kind of fun. This bar top used to be my coffee table. See how it had four legs that were set into it like this? My uncle made it from one piece of virgin longleaf pine. So this is the this was the center of the tree. Whenever I watch sawmill videos, they say you don't want the center of the tree, uh, but I don't. But this is fine. I guess if it's virgin and this this right here constitutes about a hundred years from there to there, it's fine. But on faster growing stuff, maybe it would be a problem. It's epoxy coated. I haven't done anything to this. This has been my coffee table for 30 years. Um, this other countertop is shortleaf pine, and you can see the difference. This countertop my father made to sort of match this one. He matched the thickness. This is the shortleaf pine tree that fell on my grandparents' house, which yielded me these sliding glass doors to use for windows. Now this window used to be a sliding glass door. In about 2011, I replaced it with plate glass from the, from the glass supplier. I'm not real happy that I can see the sealant through the glass. I, and right down here, you can see where they sprayed it with Windex and you've got that blue color in there. This kind of bothers me. Next to my refrigerator, I have one closet. It's the only closet in my whole house. And here's a hint as to what's in it. I moved into my house before it was finished because my aunt wanted the bedroom where I was staying to be her bedroom so that she could turn her bedroom into the kitchen. And in the process of that remodeling project, this door got displaced. So it's now my closet door. I turned it over. This was the bottom of the door and a mouse chewed the door up so I just thought it would be less obvious at the top than at the bottom so I turned the whole door over. Also the doorknob was way too low for me. Inside my minuscule closet I keep a few essentials uh, including my Electrolux vacuum cleaner that I bought in about 1996. I think it was made for cleaning hotels. It has a 75 foot cord. My house is 18 feet by 12 feet. The back of the door is where I keep my hammock chair. Typically after hurricanes when my power is out for several days, my habit is to get out the hammock chair and read all of my books. You know how some people have little platitudes on plaques in their house? I keep all of mine inside this closet. My dad made this live oak beam for me. It's two pieces, so there's a beam shelf. Uh, so the bottom piece is screwed and glued to the top piece, and then the screw heads are covered. My dad made it in his shop, and then I went and got it in my car. We tested it, by we put the ends up on five gallon buckets, and then we both stood on it and measured how much it flexed and it flexed less than an inch over the whole 12 foot length and it's really good for uh, traction you put traction in your back I can't stop swinging <laughs> ah! bedrooms have special rules like you have to have a special kind of outlet and you have to have special egress windows but if you have a removable ladder technically it's not a bedroom So the ladder is removable. It just lifts up. I cut the two by six side pieces of this ladder uh, to fit. I cut the notches and everything, and then I, and I marked for the steps. 
and then I took the whole thing to my dad's shop and he built it for me and then I brought it home in my car and put it in place he has really nice woodworking equipment I do not he routed out that little handle that was all his idea it was brilliant that's the best part I put the floor of my loft down with the V groove side down and I pre-finished it with water-based polyurethane because the kitchen side seemed like the part that needed to be sealed. I put my 2x4s on 12 inch centers because they're shit. Look, I see I sanded all the, the rough spots off of them and pre-stained them before I built this. And they're just the quality of lumber at the at the big box store is just garbage. So I just put them a lot closer together. This is where I keep my outdoor kitchen skewer. One of my favorite features of my tiny house is these handrails that I built into the window frame. I saw this idea in a fine home building article. And it's just really great. I love them. Um, I had a vertigo attack a few years ago and I had to hold on to something every step I took and these were invaluable. The steps to my loft start out with this sort of alternating tread design and I did the most basic thing it's just a bracket on the wall the little ends get a chunk of wood and the big ends get a bracket this platform is a seat and that's why there's this yoga mat up here so I bought this yoga mat to put on my hard metal stools and this is what was left over that's why it doesn't go the whole distance but I sort of like it because when I'm when I come down the stairs, if I'm coming down the stairs from my loft, when I step down and I hit the yoga mat, I know I'm at the bottom. This is the loft of my tiny house. This is my escape window. So in a serious emergency, I can open this window and kick out the screen and climb down onto the outdoor shower surround and make my escape. It's not technically an egress window, but it is for me because I'm small and I can totally fit through that. Uh, this is a fire prone place, but I designed my house to be fireproof, so hopefully if I'm surrounded by fire, I will smell the smoke and I will skedaddle out the front door and get a hose and start trying to put it out. Or I could open it and use it as a arrow slot for the zombie apocalypse. I could fire down upon the hordes that are trying to overtake my highly defensible position. I was already living here before I put up the ceiling. There was no loft here yet. Every Saturday morning I would move my bed outside and all my stuff and put it up under one of those 10 by 10 pop-up tents and then I'd work on the house. So before the loft was even here, I had a man come on a Saturday and screw the sheetrock to the ceiling. It's a green board, it's the moisture resistant kind. It's important to me that this be airtight for soundproofing. This is my only operable window. Everything in here is sealed tight because I want it to be soundproof. So I caulked the joints because I didn't have time for, for taping and mudding and sanding. I had to get this all done in two days. So I caulked the joints and then I painted. Um, and the reason this is two colors is not just for this delightful sunrise sunset look. That's just all the paint I had. Um, I started, I, I bought a gallon of this kind of peach color as oops paint and I painted the ceiling with that. And it was just too dark and it was kind of gross. It looked like an esophagus. And I had some of this yellow paint. So I painted uh, until I ran out. And I was almost out here so I added some glaze and sort of blended it in just to make it look like I did it on purpose. But ultimately, I would like to take all this down, um, cut my caulk, take the sheetrock down, and add some rock wool insulation I don't have enough insulation in my roof, only maybe R12. My air conditioner would work a lot better in the summer if I had more insulation and it wouldn't get as cold in the winter. This is a pretty mild climate, so it's not a huge deal, 
but it's sort of in my my want to do list. There's nothing wrong with the sheetrock, so I could take it down, put in insulation, and then put the same sheetrock back up, and then take the time to tape it and mud it and paint it all um, a nice color, white, maybe I don't know. But I'd like to sand it, and I'd like a better paint finish because I can touch it and. Everywhere there's a little imperfection in the paint, it bugs me. <laughs> I don't have any sheet goods in my house because I can't lift it by myself. So the roof is, the metal is screwed directly to purlins. But before I put the metal on the purlins, I put sill seal down on the purlins as a vibration barrier so that the raindrops on the metal roof don't transfer directly to the wood members. And then I also put spray foam directly on the bottom side of the metal um, and that dulls, that dampens the, the vibration a lot. But um, making it airtight and damping the vibration, all of those things uh, made it a lot quieter than it would be without. I can compare by going on the porch in a rainstorm and it's way louder without any of the insulation on it and the airtight ceiling. So this is what it sounds like inside the shed. Pretty loud. Here's the sound of a nice hard rain from my front porch. Don't get enough light on the meter. There we go. Less loud than the shed. Now we'll try inside. Immediately it gets quieter. light on the meter. 50 dB. So that's about, so that's 50 dB or less. Now let's compare the main part of the house to the bathroom. not really raining that hard right now. The metal roof on the house is way quieter than the shed or the Spartans because of the sill seal. Because of the closed cell foam I put on top of the purlins, the metal just can't conduct as much sound energy into the structure. So whatever is coming through is coming through the air. This isn't bad, but sometimes when it rains really hard, woof. It's still loud though, but what are you going to do? People that say they love the sound of rain on a metal roof, yeah, how far is your head from the ceiling? So the problem with my scheme to add insulation to the ceiling, I only need 20 pieces, 20 physical pieces of insulation, which is four packages of five, but they only sell it in sets of 12. I found out after I built this house that you're supposed to put sheetrock behind tongue and groove boards for fire resistance. I had no idea. And how ridiculous is that? I'm not doing that. This house is so tiny. If there was a fire in here, I would just be dead from the smoke before it even started a wall on fire. I mean, just the smoke right out of the appliance that started the fire would kill me. So who cares if the walls burn the hell up? I had just better get the hell out. I have a smoke detector, so as soon as the smoke detector goes off, I go out the door. When it's actually time to go to sleep, I have to do some modifications to my bed. On the wall right there, I have some magnets that hold this meat tray that I got at a flea market. And I have to take this tray and slide it under my mattress like this. Let's uh, put this mallet 
under there and that raises my bed up six inches so that I can so then when it's sleeping time I sleep this way because I have acid reflux and I have to have my head elevated this is my live oak persuader that just happens to work perfectly for this So here's a million dollar idea. It's like a Murphy bed, but instead of folding up against the wall, the foot drops down so that your head is elevated six inches. It would need to be like a regular bed, the, a convenient height for changing the sheets and getting in and out, but then you can change the, the foot height. Not like an expensive motorized hospital bed, but just something like a Ikea bed, but that lets you drop the, the foot down. I've been editing this video and realized it's over 50 minutes long, but I never recorded an ending. At the end of every tiny house tour, they always ask how much it cost. I saved all my receipts for this house, but I haven't gone back and added them up. I kept meaning to make a spreadsheet, but I just haven't done it. Um, it cost under $25,000. I had to spend most of my money on infrastructure, the septic tank, and getting the well repaired. And I already had a well dug. All I had to do is put a new um, pump in it. So getting a well from scratch and getting a power line run would be very expensive. But because I used an old house site that already had some existing infrastructure, I saved some money there. I moved out of Atlanta and built my tiny house because of a giant technology recession. And I built this tiny house to sort of recession proof myself. When I finished my tiny house in 2006, I started graduate school, <laughs> ominous, because I wanted to further my second career in uh, environmental engineering. And sure enough, in 2008, when there was another giant recession, I lost my job in my second career and thanks to my tiny house I've been able to continue not having a job. I worked briefly in 2010 in Austin and I was able to just close up my tiny house. I blocked the drain traps I turned off all the circuit breakers except the refrigerator and the refrigerator provided a little bit of dehumidifying and my house was able to just be vacant for a year and it was fine and it didn't cost anything I put my internet on vacation mode and my power bill was ten dollars a month just for having a meter um, and it was great to be able to have the mobility to go and take a job somewhere else and now I'm doing fine in a pandemic because I already never left the house and only bought groceries every two weeks. My expenses are so low, I can make a living making things and selling them on Etsy. I can get obsessed about a board game and spend two years in research and development. After an estuaries class in graduate school, I went up to the professor and asked him how development was compatible with preserving the ecology. And he just looked at me like I was ignorant and said, it's not. As long as there's economic growth, the ecology is de facto going to decline. Like everybody knew that. And everybody accepted it. But I don't accept it. I don't think that growing the economy is worth destroying nature. What's the point of growing the economy? I decided to do an experiment in not having economic growth. How small could I make my life? So I've been running this experiment for a while now. You can make it pretty small. But I think that it would work a lot better if we had universal health care. I enjoy building science. I like learning about the new products and seeing how people are using different materials. Maybe I watch too much sci-fi but I keep waiting for them to stop talking about HVAC and just refer to the life support system of a house. 
My main challenge here in South Georgia is humidity control, but it's only a matter of time before we need CO2 scrubbers in our houses. While building science is important, it's not more important than the whole point of a house, which is shelter. If you've got to get out of the rain and out of the cold, you've got to do what you've got to do. If you only end up with R12 insulation in your ceiling, one thing you learn as a scientist is you can't change all your variables at once. When I'm thinking of solutions to problems, I can think of a whole lot of things to try, but I have to force myself to only try one at a time or I won't know which one worked. I feel like a house this small is a good opportunity to try some stuff. So I sort of did some stuff on my tiny house knowing that it could, it could fail. I barely did any of the stuff you're supposed to do to make a house tight. I didn't use any expensive tape. I didn't use um, OSB sheathing. I didn't use sheetrock. Um, all I did was use open cell spray foam. And yet my house is so tight, it behaves like a loudspeaker enclosure. My tiny house contains about 900 cubic feet of air. And the front door is basically like a port on a loudspeaker. And you can calculate the spring constant of the volume of air inside that doorway. And trying to close the door is like pushing against a spring. It wants to come open again. And that's how I can tell my house is airtight. The same thing is true of my Spartan. It's so tight that if I have a window open, it's much easier to close the door. I did some things on my house that I was pretty sure weren't going to work, like putting the, the posts all the way down into a hole in the ground. But did I really have a choice? It was the safest way to build it by myself, and the way I fixed it later was pretty good. I might do it again, build a house with the posts all the way into the ground and then later cut them off and put the concrete under them. It seems like a ridiculous order to do it in, but I honestly haven't been able to think of a better way because at the time I just needed to get started. I needed to make progress and the investment and the labor of the concrete, I just, I wasn't in a place to do that then. And honestly, I don't feel bad about that. I think it worked. I got 10 years out of those posts. Maybe that's all I needed. Maybe in 10 years, I would have been able to afford to build a bigger house and I could have had a house mover come, saw off all these posts and pull this house out of here, sell it to somebody else who could put it on concrete. And I think flexibility is important. You can't be too hard on yourself thinking that you're gonna do something once and not ever touch it again. There's nothing wrong with touching it again. I took that shitty water heater out of here. I stuck it in my warehouse for a few years and then I built my lab and I needed a water heater for my laundry room. I used it again. It's fine. There were some parts of my house that I really couldn't figure out and I had to go and ask my dad for help. And he was really pretty short with me. He does not approve of starting a project where you can't visualize every detail all the way through and know ahead of time what you're gonna do all the way to the end. But I didn't have the mental capacity to do that. I had to just start and I had to just trust myself that I would figure it out. I had to trust that my dad would tell me how to do it. And he did. He didn't want to. And he didn't really like how I did it. But while I would love to be able to picture every detail all the way through to the end of the job, that's just not practical. I know myself a little bit better than that. I have confidence that it will work out, and I have confidence that once I'm standing back looking at it, I'll know what to do next. But sometimes I just have to see it full scale and in 3D before I can really picture what's gonna happen next. And I could feel bad that I'm not doing it right, but I don't. I have a house to live in, and it shelters me from thunderstorms. I have been through a lot of hurricanes in this house. And every time there's a hurricane, I start thinking about my windows and I wonder if they're going to get sucked out of the hole because there's nothing really holding them in there but finished nails and caulk. But they never get sucked out and they are tempered glass, so I've got that going for me. I wonder if I would be crushed to death if a tree fell on my tiny house. But honestly, I think I built it better than most people's houses. Because of that rigid frame, I'm probably better off. I have double 2 by 6 beams across the tops of my walls instead of just... Um, two by four double top plates.
pretty common for trees to fall on houses. If you're in a big house, the chance that the tree will fall on the part of the house you're in, I guess, is reduced. And in my tiny house, if a tree fell on it and crushed it, it would get me for sure. But what I've decided about trees falling on the house is it depends on how far away the tree is. If it's really close to the house, it just sort of leans against the house. But if it's far away and it's all the way up to speed, it's going to smash the shit out of your house and there's nothing you can do about it. Whenever there's a hurricane, and there's a lot, they say to get to an inside room away from windows. And I don't have an inside room away from windows. So I channel my cousin Annie and I fill the bathtub with pillows and I get in there and read. That's all for the Beach and Buck Rivet Report. Go buck yourself.